The federal nationwide eviction moratorium expired at midnight on Saturday, leaving millions of Americans at risk of being kicked out of their homes. NBC reports that only a fraction of the country's emergency rental assistance funds have been distributed and found that 26 states have distributed less than 10 percent of their allocations. This comes as roughly 7.5 million Americans are expected to lose COVID-era income support on September 6th. More than 9 million people were receiving the assistance as of July 10th, according to the Labor Department. Journalist and co-founder of Inquire More, Zed Jelani, joins us to discuss. Zed, welcome to the program. Great to be here. Zed, is, is this the worst example of democratic fecklessness that you've ever seen, or can you think of anything that tops it? No, I mean, I think it's, a, it's an example of everyone being feckless at the same time. Uh, as Kim mentioned, coming into this, Congress between, I think, December and March, last December and March, appropriated something like 40 something billion dollars uh, for rental assistance, right? And th the reality is that that assistance could only be distributed through states, right? They decided to basically ask states to set up their own programs, do their own outreach. Um, last month, the Urban Institute, or actually late June, the Urban Institute partnered with a local kind of landlord organization and surveyed landlords and tenants about this program. And they found that about half of the tenants didn't even know the program existed. And this was in June, but mind you, like Congress have been passing this money since last December. And in June, half of American renters didn't even know there was a program for rental assistance that existed. Um, that's obviously a failing at every level, right? It's a failing of Democrats and Republicans and state governments and local governments and Congress. They should have been doing outreach and should have been coordinating the, the people at different levels. But I was particularly shocked by the way that they've tried to play the kind of the spin game in the in the long stretch is that one uh, Speaker Pelosi had said that she had basically no idea this was going to happen. It was kicked to her at the last moment. Well, you know, we had a, a high profile court case that basically said Congress has to authorize this going forward. It can't be unilateral through the CDC or the administration. That's what the Biden administration had been saying. Um, when they tried to call up the bill for unanimous consent, apparently the Republicans blocked it. So Pelosi was blaming the Republicans, of course. You can just have a recorded vote to get it through. Uh, they didn't do that. Um, it's been reported that it's likely because people in the Democratic caucus didn't want to extend it. Um, so yeah, we, we have just a failure of coordination at many different levels. Uh, one conclusion that you would come to is just that people in the government don't take this very seriously. And a lot of them don't think it's as big of a deal um, as maybe some of the advocates do. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I think, unfortunately, this is also the sort of instance where people you know, they lose faith in government, too. They lose faith in the government to respond to problems like this. Uh, so they're less likely to support them in the future as well, which I think is a long term impact. Well, as far as I know, there isn't a big rental lobby, you know, for for renters. And so that is why I think maybe Congress just doesn't seem to care as much. They just don't have a bunch of money to go to Congress and to say, hey, this is what we need. In fact, they're a group of people that are needing money from some of the big money interests. So um, you know, I, I think that the, the big issue is that there are so many millions of Americans of uh, Americans who are they're owing rent to their landlords. I have uh, many friends where I live right now dealing with this, where they have not been able to pay rent for the last year or there was at least a period of time. Maybe they're paying rent now, but there was a period of time where they were not and they were accumulating all of this rent debt. And now uh, if the eviction moratorium is lifted, I mean, are we going to see a bunch of mass evictions of these people that owe thousands of dollars potentially in rent? Yeah, so I mean, there's a few factors here. One is that there are some state and local moratoriums as well. So like, I think New Jersey, New York and California have their own moratoriums that last a little bit longer, like some of them go through September. So that, that may stave off a little bit of it. There's also some local uh, places that moved in the last minute. Like there was a, a judge in, um, I believe it was in DeKalb or Winnet in Georgia that basically imposed a two month moratorium additionally. So there are some places like that doing that. Second, the, the millions number that people keep citing, you know, comes from surveys, right? And the surveys basically come from the renters' perceptions. Uh, there are some reasons if you're a landlord to not actually evict someone at this time. One, it'll be giving you an empty spot where, you know, you have to go find somebody else. Two, maybe because Congress was extremely like fickle in the face of this, um, states will actually step up with that rental assistance money because most of them still have the majority of it. Like that money is still out there uh, and it would help keep people in, in, in kind of their places and, and landlords would expect to get that money if, if they actually step up and are able to negotiate with their with their tenants and work together to, to apply. Because in many cases, 
the tenant and the landlord has to apply. They have to apply together. They have to both reach out to the program and, and negotiate with the with the state or the locality. So, I mean, there are some reasons to think this may not be as severe as as hope, but it is kind of playing a little bit of a game of roulette because, again, Congress didn't kind. Congress enacted a, a more or less of a solution, um, but the solution has been kind of like horribly mismanaged and and distributed, right? And the question is now like, okay, they didn't have the moratorium, which many people were also critical of, but it's, you know, like a heavy handed measure, but like the alternative is rental assistance. And, you know, you're kind of between a rock and a hard place on that. Um, I think a lot of it honestly is on the states and localities. Like they do have to start using that money seriously and like getting out to people and like just contacting a bunch of landlords and saying, hey, we can keep these people in there. We can get you, we can get you paid. Um, so just slow down on the evictions and we'll, we'll speed up on our money, so. Fresh. But one point to make on that is that, uh, from at least where I am, the landlord has to agree to taking a bit of a cut. So in order for them to get that money, they have to agree that they're going to reduce the the overall bill by 20 or 30 percent. And, you know, here in Los Angeles, I believe that they have to agree to a 30 percent cut. So and that we're a very liberal area. So I can't imagine what the agreement is in other areas. And then the other thing I think that a lot of landlords are looking at is especially in these smaller communities around the country, they're watching, they're, they're, they're getting a huge influx of people coming in from places like New York, like California that are fleeing the big cities that want to go into the smaller areas because they can now work remotely. And so they could take their big city money and spend it in the small cities. And so there is a huge risk, I think, for renters, especially in those communities where people are coming in that the landlord wants to get them out in order to raise rent and get those new people in from San Francisco and Los Angeles and New York in. I think that's a big risk. Yeah. And so uh, speaking, speaking, of, uh, speaking of this, this outflow, you know, freshman Congresswoman Cori Bush spent the night at the Capitol over the weekend urging her colleagues to return from recess. Let's take a listen. But when you hear the cries of others, when you hear the suffering of others, we're already fighting a battle and losing a battle because there are people who slept out last night, the night, the night before. There are people who are already unhoused and we don't have enough, uh, we don't have enough um, shelters. We don't have enough, we don't have the safe housing for them right now. And that's a failure. That's another moral failure on our society. And so to then say, yeah, seven million more, you can go while I go on vacation. Seven million more, you can hit the, go ahead. Like that was your decision to be in this position. No, no, this is a systemic problem. This is a structural problem that can be handled by better policy decisions. Other progressives and squad members, including AOC, Jamal Bowman, Ayanna Presley, and more, joined Bush at the Capitol to show their support for extending the eviction moratorium. Zed, my, my take on this is that uh, a lot of Democrats have been secretly okay with this eviction moratorium uh, expiring. And it goes back to the idea that Democrats will, will fight for working people as long as there's zero risk to it. And as housing prices were rising, as, as rental prices were rising, now all of a sudden I'm, the, there's, there's a political cost associated with the moratorium. I don't, I don't think that the moratorium has anything to do with the, with the rising housing prices. I think that can be explained by all of the other factors that are, that are quite obvious in, in front of us, people moving around, low, low interest rates. But I do think it created a political cost. And once there's a political cost, for Democrats to do something good for working people, they decide not to do it. What's, is that too cynical? What do you think, Zed? No, I mean, look, like, it it actually isn't possible that they wouldn't be able to extend the moratorium unless there are people within their own party blocking it because of the majority in the House of Representatives. Um, one thing that was very clear is like they w they wouldn't allow any kind of recorded vote, right? Like if they there was an actual roll call vote on extending the moratorium, you would see who is in favor and who is opposed. Uh, and in this case, it seems like they were trying to politically shield a lot of those members because they maybe they would have gotten hit from both sides. They would have gotten hit from landlords who didn't like the moratorium. Uh, and they would have gotten hit from renters who wanted to keep the moratorium or other activists who are sympathetic to them. Um, so they, you know, it was kind of a, it was kind of just like a political dodge, right? To not allow another vote on it. 
Um, and then on the flip side, like I said, it's just sharing confidence and just like mismanagement at many different levels of government that you appropriate $40 billion and like only a fraction of it has actually been used for rental assistance. I don't know, maybe less than one, one fourth or something like that probably. Um, you know, this is, this is the kind of thing that makes people really cynical about government working for them. And, you know, if you are a party that's trying to hold your majority in the midterms, um, you can hardly complain when a lot of people drop off in voting. That's exactly, I know, Ryan, you know this, because you were on the Hill at that time reporting. That's exactly what happened in 2010 during the midterms. A lot of people uh, who felt dispirited about the foreclosure crisis and about health care, about the economy, and unemployment, just uh, dropped off in voting and the Republicans took the majority. And so if, if that happens again, we know one of the, one of the reasons why. Again, there's no renters lobby, you know, and renters are at the bottom of the totem pole. I mean, they don't have any capital in a capitalist society. So it's a it's a really rough go for these people. I mean, they don't have any real sway. And so they're just going to be literally left out in the cold. And it's inter it's interesting, though, because in big cities, ten the tenant lobbies are huge. Uh, D.C. has great uh, tenant lobbies. Every city council person you know, wants to make sure that they're on the right side of the tenant lobbies. Buildings are themselves well organized and then other tenants around the city or organize among themselves. But, but they're it, not but it is interesting. To the no, 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 you're right. Orders. You're totally yeah. right. They have not federalized that power ever. And maybe this will be a trigger to say, yeah. you know what, you're, you're already organized. Like you, right. the tenants are organized in this building. They're organized around this city. Every, you know, pretty much every major city has a significant tenant, you know, pro-tenant lobby, and as a result, has good tenant laws. But they just have never bothered to take that to the federal level, and maybe this will be a, a trigger to make them do that. Seth, it's great having you on the show. Yeah, thanks, guys. And we'll have more rising right after this.